Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. All right. Hey, uh, sorry about that. A little technical problem to get started, but um, here we are. I'm Sarah Dash, President and CEO of the Alliance for Health Policy, and I want to welcome you to the sixth week of our COVID-19 webinar series. For those who are not familiar with the Alliance, welcome. We are a nonpartisan resource for the policy community dedicated to advancing knowledge and understanding of health policy issues. We launched this series to provide insight into the status of the COVID-19 response and shed light on remaining gaps in the system that must be addressed to limit the severity in the United States. The Alliance for Health Policy gratefully acknowledges the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation and the Commonwealth Fund for supporting our COVID-19 webinar series. You can join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag AllHealthLive and follow us at AllHealthPolicy. We want you all to be active participants in today's uh, very important discussion, so please do get your questions ready. Here's how you do it. You should see a dashboard on the right side of your web browser that has a speech bubble icon with a question mark. You can use that to submit the questions that you have for the panelists at any time. We'll be collecting them and address as many as we can during the broadcast. And we have an extra long webinar for you today, a full hour to uh, ask your questions. So um, please do feel free to send those in at any time. You can also use that webinar, or, I'm sorry, that icon to notify us if you have any technical issues. Check out our website, allhealthpolicy.org, for background materials and a recording of today's webinar. As policymakers weigh options to ease social distancing measures, a robust surveillance infrastructure is critical to prevent another surge in cases. This system will require close collaboration between the federal government, states, localities, and many facets of the healthcare system, as well as individual behavior. During this webinar, Panelists will explore options policymakers can pursue to strengthen our surveillance infrastructure as we move from mitigation to containment of the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by a group of distinguished panelists. First, we'll hear from Erin Meary, the Chief Information Officer for the University of Texas at Austin, Dell Medical School, and UT Health Austin. Next is Dr. Joseph Eisenberg, the John G. Searle Endowed Chair and Professor of Epidemiology at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. And finally, I'd like to welcome Jim Blumenstock, who is the Chief Program Officer for Health Security at the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, ASTO. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. I'm gonna to turn it over to each of you for some opening remarks, starting with Aaron. Aaron Meary, go ahead. Hello, and thank you all for listening and then the tuning in. Uh, some of the big things that we have going on here at the University of Texas at Austin, particularly as it relates to contact tracing and home monitoring and whatnot as we battle COVID, we have found a tremendous uh, willingness in the community to partner and want to get in front of this. The outpouring of support from both patients and from just the community in general has been phenomenal. But with that, as you leverage in and, and layer in technology and whatnot, you always learn some important lessons. So hopefully today, I'll walk you through some of those in real time. I'll walk you through some of the things that we have overcome and challenges, and then some of the partnerships that we've done both with local and state authorities and national authorities on trying to advance um, care and dealing with COVID-19 in all dimensions, particularly uh, as it relates to contact tracing and home monitoring. So thank you. Great, thanks so much, Aaron. All right, and next, um, Joe, would you like to offer us some uh, quick opening remarks? Yeah, I want to just talk a little bit about the role of testing in the midst of uh, an epidemic like we have here in the U.S. Um, just there's been much talk about the need for testing. You know, we've been told about the success of um, early on in the pandemics in countries like South Korea and Germany, where the testing was talked about as key successes to controlling the epidemic. And we've also been told about how far behind we are in the number of tests we're performing. Um, although we are certainly observing civic ramp ups in, in um, various states on testing. So I just wanted to touch upon, you know, what are, what's the role of testing and why is it so important to move forward on testing and testing, increasing testing numbers. There's really two major roles for testing that can play in controlling the spread of an epidemic. First, it's a essential surveillance tool. You know, without this information about cases of infection and disease, we're, we're pretty much flying blind with respect to developing appropriate intervention and control procedures. And there's two types of tests that we can use for surveillance. And the first is what we really 
been talking about quite a bit, and that's the testing for the, of the presence of the virus in an individual to assess if a person is infected. And the second is to test to see if a person has antibodies against the virus. Person has antibodies, this means that they've been exposed to the virus um, and they've either experienced symptoms, mild or severe, or they've, they've been asymptomatic, they're asymptomatic infections. And so this provides valuable information on the extensiveness of the um, transmission that's that's occurred because it's capturing these mild and asymptomatic cases that we um, otherwise would have missed through the conventional testing. And so it's a really important part of and a complement to our surveillance toolbox. But the second important role of testing, and I think we've been, you know, when we talk about testing numbers, this is what we're really focused on is the importance of testing as a tool for control of viral spread. So by isolating those tested, um, as well as their contacts, um, we can contain the spread in a much more efficient way than broad scale social distancing that we're doing, we're seeing right now. So we can really think about the testing and contact tracing and isolation as a targeted social distancing approach. So to control the disease effectively, we have to, and as we relax social distancing, we need to increase that testing and containment activity. Um, ideally, we're testing all suspected cases, regardless of severity and their contacts. And in this way, we're able to prevent case clusters from developing and, and a, a way to move forward. So these two testing activities provide the essential information needed to, again, move forward over the next year or even two and allow us to relax social distancing in a very strategic method methodical manner that ensures that we keep the cases low in numbers and not increasing. So strategically, we should be relaxing social distancing slowly, first allowing work sectors that only result in low probability events. And then by providing appropriate guidance to the work sectors on mitigation, we can maximize opening up the economy. So increasing testing and containment allows us to increase the relaxing of social distancing and maximize again this um, opening of the economy. So the next major question is really about how much testing is needed. And we hear numbers all over the map, a wide range, some saying five to 20 million tests per day in the US. On the low, lower end, we're hearing things like that suggest that we need to increase our current capacity like threefold in Michigan went from our capacity is steadily increasing now in the order of 5,000 tests. So reaching 15,000 tests is, is actually quite doable um, and largely a supply chain problem. The percent test positive is an important metric here. So that's the percent of tests that are positive. And in Michigan, we're at about 20% and we'd like to see that number decrease to 10. Um, so more published studies on testing um, are used most published studies on testing are used to forecast models to estimate the testing numbers needed to move forward. And needless to say, these forecasts from these models are highly uncertain, and they contain many assumptions about efficacy of social distancing about, and contact tracing and isolation. And there's also a lot of uncertainty about the amount of transmission that has already occurred. So this really explains that wide range of estimates on what testing rate we need to move forward. The more cases, the more testing that's needed. Hence, if we can, you know, the percent positive metric is this useful indicator on how many tests we actually need. Syndromic surveillance can also do a lot in helping contain. And again, it can make our testing much more efficient. Information on symptom based surveillance provides a quicker response than relying on a passive surveillance and case identification. And we're currently, lots of people are developing apps now, or, or people are beginning to develop apps that are um, make this even more efficient. And lastly, I just want to mention that, you know, population immunity is an important piece of this puzzle, but there's a lot of uncertainty associated with how much protection somebody has with them when they do recover. And this is likely to be a function of their health status whether or not they had a mild or severe disease and also a function of the virus. So there's, a, there's also a lot of question of how long protection will last. So ultimately, I believe that the population immunity will play an important role in protection eventually, establish it as the virus 
established itself as an endemic disease. Um, and herd immunity is this important concept. The number of people needed to so that were protected and the virus can't really transmit. And we use this concept in developing vaccine strategies all the time. You know, many people have estimated this level to be at 60% of the population. But you know, at this point, we can only speculate on all these, these kind of numbers. So that with, with that, that kind of gives a, a hopefully an overview of, of the role of testing, why it's important, why we need to really ramp testing up in moving forward in this in this pandemic as we relax social distancing. Great, thank you so much, Joe. That was a that was a real tour de force. I feel like I was back in uh, epidemiology class, and I think you gave us a lot of food for thought. Um, so again, for the audience, if you have questions, follow up questions, feel free to just go ahead and send those in using your question mark icon. So now I'm happy to turn this over to Jim Blumenstock from ASTO. Jim, go ahead. Well, thank you so much, and good day, everybody. Um, you know, first, allow me to state the obvious, that the nation's public health system is really on the front lines in this war against COVID-19, um, with our principal focus right now being on containment and mitigation. And as I see it, um, really, our work is in four specific tracks or phases um, that would include response, restoration, or what's also being referred to as reopening of, of, of commerce, um, recovery, which we cannot lose sight of and certainly begin to have a vision for, and overall community resilience. Um, just to provide you a quick snapshot of really what our immediate and longer term response objectives are in the context of COVID-19. Your, your state, territorial, public health, and even tribal um, health agencies or health entities um, conduct such activities uh, as aggressive on uh, integrated incident management, um, maintaining an emergency operations center in coordination with other components of their government, including emergency management and homeland security. Um, they're responsible for the health and safety of responders. Um, and critically important to any public health emergency, but I think it's certainly rearing its ugly head with COVID-19, is the issue of, of health equity and at-risk and vulnerable populations and trying to develop like, strategies and tactics to address their immediate and unique needs. Um, clearly, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a few moments, is the issue of information sharing. Um, not, a date, not only data um, as part of, of an analysis and intelligence for uh, decision support, but also public information, including warnings and effective risk communications. Uh, another key part, which I think is, is related to Joe's remarks, is around countermeasures and other types of mitigation. Um, Non-pharmaceutical interventions, uh, such as times when we don't have a vaccine or a proven therapeutic, uh, is critically important through such things as social distancing. Um, quarantine and isolation as not only legal tools, but also um, effective uh, tactics is a role that state and territorial public health agencies play in, uh, in issuing, monitoring, and encouraging voluntary compliance. Um, and lastly, is around the medical material. Um, a lot of discussion about local jurisdictions asking for, receiving, and distributing the strategic national stockpile. Um, many jurisdictions maintain their own state caches and will probably continue to do so throughout the, this campaign of COVID-19 response. Um, and already, um, the, the, the public health system is looking, looking forward, um, looking ahead to what a national vaccination campaign can be. Um, you know, those of us who were in the field and worked during H1N1 10 years ago have a full appreciation for what it's like um, to distribute medical countermeasures, antivirals, when available, as well as a vaccine when it comes available, um, that has to go above and beyond what is typically available through the capacity of traditional healthcare systems, whether it be your private physician, your pharmacist, or even places of, of employment. So that is certainly a planning effort underway right now as we're um, managing this response. Surge staff, um, not only in the public health field, but also helping their healthcare partners uh, navigate some of the licensing and legal requirements and other types of barriers that may exist to ensure um, an all hands on deck um, mutual aid type of environment and obviously infection control, not only as a workforce protection effort, uh, but certainly in high risk facilities like nursing homes um, that where infection control is a critically important aspect um, is a role where health departments play not only as educators, but sometimes as regulators. 
Um, and the last two areas, again, is biosurveillance, like, which I know we'll talk about at a great length in, in, during the course of the hour. Uh, and again, getting back to the issue of recovery. Um, as you can imagine, and, and for those of you that could sort of draw the analog between major natural disasters like hurricanes Katrina, Sandy, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, you can imagine that a recovery of a community um, certainly measured in months, if not years. Well, you know, COVID as an infectious disease um, has a different um, set of manifestations, but the impact on our, our, on our human infrastructure um, is, I think, equally, equally as vulnerable as our hard infrastructure would be during natural disasters. So what does this mean to the healthcare workforce, the public health workforce, the, met, the, um, the emotional, behavioral, mental health of our society um, as we continue through this? The programs and services um, that may be somewhat neglected as, a, as sort of a, um, a second order consequence um, because we're moving all of our resources and focus on COVID-19. So clearly that's not only a planning effort, but it's also a long-term longitudinal um, you know, community resilience focus as well. Um, you know, before I close, I, I really want to pick up on a point. Uh, Joe did an outstanding job uh, overviewing the, the importance of testing, not only what it means to the case, uh, to his or her contacts, but also the community um, that's impacted for the purposes of not only patient care, um, individual counseling, but also determining interventions that may be necessary for specific communities being driven by the data that's available from testing. Um, but the second part of that um, strategy, if you will, is the issue of contact tracing. And as Joe had mentioned, that, that, that is critically important following testing so that you know, individuals who, who are ill can be isolated and individuals who've been directly exposed to sick cases can be quarantined um, and monitored, all as, a, as an effective strategy to contain and basically suppress um, any outbreaks that may take place in a community. And you know, if I, you know, asking everybody just to go back to two or three months ago when we were in the containment phase, uh, that was all about trying to keep the virus out of our country um, and when it got here, trying to contain it in small pockets of communities for as long as possible in order to allow it to, to sort of ramp up the infrastructure. That was where we were on the, on the other side of the curve where it was starting to increase. Um, now we're sort of approaching that, that point where we're going to be on the back side of the curve. So, you know, moving across from, uh, moving from mitigation back to a containment strategy state by state, county by county, community by community, is becoming a, uh, another phase of that type of, of containment or outbreak suppression effort. So to have sufficient workforce to go in and respond to cases that have been identified, speak and interview and counsel their contacts so they don't continue to spread um, infection with the community is the success to not only um, you know, full on reopening but also sort of that tipping point of getting into more um, normal societal um, activities. So how do we accomplish that? Well, you know, again, different models, different projections, uh, but one thing everyone agrees with, that the current public health workforce in this country is woefully insufficient to meet the, the labor demand of having contact tracers or disease intervention specialists um, do the amount of work that is necessary to achieve that goal of suppressing future outbreaks. Um, ASTA was pleased, pleased to contribute to a product that the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security uh, released two weeks ago, um, which puts out an estimate of 100,000 individuals to be nationwide contact tracers for the next 12 months um, is a reasonable projection of need that we have to rally around uh, and basically, you know, ramp up that component of our workforce at a cost estimated to be $3.6 billion. So that, that is, that's sort of the, the, the sobering point I want to leave you with, but I think you know, it's also critically important to, to recognize that you know, with the emphasis on testing, contact tracing is an equal partner in that overall strategy to suppress future de disease transmission and to protect the public health, no matter what the fate of COVID-19 is, whether you know whether it sort of just becomes an endemic disease, it becomes a roaring seasonal disease with a second wave. Um, the fact that testing and contact tracing 
contact tracing will still be an integral part of our response platform regardless. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Jim and um, Joe and Aaron. I, we're going to have a great discussion. There's a lot to talk about here. All right. So the first thing I want to do is for those who, who maybe, you know, are hearing this term surveillance for the first time applied in a public health infrastructure, and you guys have done a great job of laying out some of the components of it. But maybe, Jim, I'll just start with you. Surveillance, a lot of people may think of that as, as like a totally different um, thing from public health. So what are the essential elements of surveillance? If you could just quickly kind of bullet point them out. Sure, sure. Well, certainly it's, it's, it's all about the structured collection and analysis of data to basically paint a picture of what's going on um, that would basically drive decisions for, for action. Um, that could be ranging from ongoing monitoring to aggressive interventions, um, you know, and, and everything in between. So in the, in the context of COVID-19, um, there, are, there are multiple surveillance methods or pathways that are being used. Um, you know, the one thing that, I, that my observation is that um, we, have, we have taken existing legacy surveillance systems and put them into very effective use with some modification to capture the type of data um, that we need um, to really get a fuller picture of how COVID-19 is spreading, impacting, and affecting the health and safety of our community. Um, and that would include everything from obviously the reporting of cases to the reporting of deaths to the existing systems that, that exist. Um, syndromic surveillance, um, looking at the influenza-like illness um, platforms that are out there and using them and possibly enhancing that a little bit to sort of capture the COVID-19 um, uh, issue. Um, another project I'd like to share, you know, um, on public opinion polling. ASTO is working with CDC and Harvard um, to ramp up a fairly significant public opinion polling, a uh, public opinion polling effort around COVID-19. Um, you know, someone might, might not think of that as being traditional public health surveillance, but I do, because you know, in capturing um, through a, through a methodology, uh, through a structured method of, of proven approach, capturing the data on the public's um, beliefs and values, and that, how that influences their processing and accepting of messaging around COVID risk um, is, is important. And to me, that's, a, that's just one sort of offshoot surveillance effort that the public health system is using to really try to use data to inform um, decision and action. Great, thanks. Uh, so I wanna turn to Aaron. Um, Aaron, you've, you've written a health affairs blog about how, to, how do we um, really strengthen and accelerate the data infrastructure around um, COVID-9 surveillance. So can you say a few words, what are some of the key elements that we need? Um, as Jim said, if surveillance is the structured collection and analysis of the data. Uh, wh what do we need to do to, to make it what it, what it needs to be uh, to really get back to containing COVID-19? Aaron? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I appreciate the question and it's a great question and great overview from my uh, co-panelists here with, uh, with James and uh, with Joseph. So to the degree of it, a couple things. And, um, Without getting too much of the nuances, number one, there is not uh, a readily adopted framework nationally for the bulk of the data that we need to be shared amongst the states at a national level, at a state level, whatnot. Uh, there are certain criteria, especially with the new US CDI standards, uh, uh, corporate interoperability and others that you know, we must modernize our frameworks around that our electronic medical record systems are using, our syndromic surveillance systems are using, so that we're all talking the same language on a national level to be able to share. Today, if I want to share information with, say, Austin Public Health, or I want to share information with the state or even the federal government, each of those are different types of criteria, different types of data sets, phenotypes, whatever else. There's not one set criteria for sort of a national superhighway. A lot of that was addressed with 21st Century Cures, but now, as you know, as you all know, it's been delayed a little bit in terms of information blocking and whatnot. But those standardizations must occur. So that's number one, standards. Number two, we need to make sure that we are really looking at, you know, how do we deal with uh, national provider data submission endpoints for electronic lab and case reports? How do, how do these 
how are these case reports and live reports inputted into a central common system? As you saw, the White House uh, spun up, you know, a pretty much a workaround saying, hey, email us every day, you know, with what your lab tests are, what your volumes are, what you're seeing, you know, are you, are you low on PPE? That's not the way this is supposed to work, not over email, right? We need a we need to be able to suss out that data on a national level and be able to ingest it into some sort of central repository so we can quickly get actual insights. So we've talked about standards, we've talked about coding in that, we've talked about obviously being able to submit data from a again, lab and, and, and a case report perspective. Another one is being able to look at all of the dimensions of care. We focus tremendous amount of time on the inpatient acute setting, Totally makes sense. We understand a lot of patients for COVID are presenting in the ED and then thus going up to ICU or whatever else uh, for recovery. Um, but to the degree of it, there's a number of ambulatory health systems, LTACs, uh, rehab facilities, primary care facilities in the middle of everywhere America. And those were sort of left out from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act and have not got onto modern electronic medical records. Or if they are, those record systems don't really necessarily talk to the others. So when we're looking at and trying to say, okay, how many people in Austin, Texas, potentially could be at risk for COVID or what are the demographics there? That's even hard on a local level, much less a national level to say, what is a true extrapolation of risk? You keep hearing about, you know, are we ever going to achieve herd immunity? Are we ever going to get to this end number? And we really don't even know what that is due to a lack of testing, a lack of data availability, and a lack of standards. So to the degree of it, if you look at those dimensions as being some of the key criteria, that sort of builds itself around a framework so that when you're trying to do something like contact tracing, and I'm trying to call Aaron and say, hey, Aaron, who have you encountered at the local hair salon or barbershop or the mall or, you know, you went to buy a new pair of sneakers today and you, you know, were symptomatic, who were you around? It's tough to get that data because at the end of the day, we're only as good as the data is. And right now, our national infrastructure, our public health infrastructure is woefully inadequate. So I implore folks listening to go back, look at standards modernization, look at being able to weigh to be able to suss out this data from the community and input it in the central repository, partnering with your local public health authorities and making sure that data is commonly exchanged in commonly delineated format and understanding how do we get back to realizing what's valuable here, which is the patient. At the end of the day, we have some great starting points. You see companies like Apple and Google trying to accelerate contact tracing. You look at what the ONC is doing and trying to put out guidelines and, and re referendums. But at the end of the day, we're only as good as what we have. So in a nutshell, that's what I have to say. Thank you so much. So um, what I'd like to ask you to do is take us through, if you want, just a little bit of a mini case study. Like what happens when somebody does test positive? Can you walk us through some of the key steps? Or is it all over the place? Sure, and, and your your voice was breaking up just slightly, so I'm going to make sure I heard you correctly. Oh, you want to know what happens when someone does test, test positive? That's right. Yep. Okay, no, no, <laughs> no problem. All right, so today here at UT Health Austin, a couple things. One, if a patient does test positive, uh, we obviously get, let's assume that they were tested here at UT Health uh, Austin. Uh, we do get that result immediately in the electronic medical record as a critical lab uh, value. We uh, reach out via a nursing triage team to notify the patient of your test result. Uh, the patient, of course, can get it in their electronic portal as well. Uh, we then do contact tracing on the patient to figure out who did Aaron come in contact with within a duration of time around that. Maybe you were asymptomatic before your test came back. Uh, maybe you showed early symptoms you know, a week ago and it took this long to get you a test going. Um, so we try to figure out who have you been around and build a contact list. From that contact list, each of those contacts are given a unique identifier so that we know all the people there and we track them. This is how we're able to develop, you know, sort of a, a COVID-9 case registry, for lack of a better term, and understand, okay, what's going on here within this cohort of patients, and does that have a, a, a predisposition to become a cluster? A cluster being, say, a family unit that are all suddenly positive or uh, a group of folks that maybe travel on an airplane together, those types of things. From that, we then share that information uh, with the public health authority and other systems around us to make sure that everybody understands this is what's going on, this is what we're tracking from a public health and epidemiology perspective, and we're able to, to, to work through that whole process. On the flip side, if a patient tests negative, however, they're, they're symptomatic to some degree, we're still tracking them. So we, we create a contact, they're sort of at that point uh, considered a PUI, a person under investigation. You know, what's going on here? Is there a follow-up appointment to get tested again? Perhaps your test came back erroneously negative and it really should have been positive. We're seeing a lot of that, where early tests were actually false, false indicators. 
So to the degree of it, that's where home monitoring comes into effect, where we're now asking folks to monitor their temperatures on a, on a periodic basis. We have apps that we've deployed here, but folks can call it in in other health systems to say, okay, this is where my temperature's at, and suddenly I'm approaching, you know, some sort of threshold on different, on different metrics there. So at the end of the day, like I was saying earlier, it's about the data. It's about being timely. It's about having some sort of decision support. In our case, we have a lot of that automated with a rules-based engine sort of baked in there. And it's about engaging with your community. I forget which of my panelists mentioned the, the total number of contact tracers that may be necessary across the country. But that is a very true number because even with the best of tech, even with having phenomenal companies like Apple and Google and Microsoft jump into the fray, it's still the human element. It's still understanding, okay, the nuances of Aaron walked into a store, but he didn't stay there and expose anybody. He just sort of ran through it. So the chances of exposure are low versus, oh, he hung out in this area for 20 minutes and guess what? Coughed on everybody. It's, it, there's a lot of nuance here that it's very difficult to automate, that it does take that human condition. So you have to have a good a closed loop process built out. You've got to understand your population. And then in our case here in Austin, we also have then had to work with a, a, a population of folks that don't speak English. They speak Spanish. Um, and some folks are very low socioeconomic status. They don't have smartphone technology. They don't have ability to get a hold of. We call that the disconnected population. We have to send people into the community, to the Salvation Army, to the Red Cross, to talk to them, to understand what's going on and being able to track and work with them. So it is a very involved process, but that's what it takes uh, when you have somebody positive and when you have someone negative. And this is Thank Jim, you. I, add, I think that was an excellent overview. And, and one additional feature is, you know, when you have someone either in isolation or quarantine through the contact tracing that Aaron just mentioned, you know, public health just doesn't forget about them and just monitors their daily data reporting of their, of their situation. I mean, there are some significant demands for wraparound services. Um, to really ensure not only compliance, but also the most appropriate health outcome for those individuals. So the issue of, you know, are, you know do they reside in, a, in an environment conducive to proper isolation and quarantine? How are they going to get their medical care? How are they going to get their uh, everyday creature comfort care? Uh, are there education, food supply issues, security issues? So, you know, that is, that's basically a public health system with their, with their other partners across state and local government to really ensure that when we, when we expect someone to comply with quarantine and isolation, that their best interest and their best care is in some way planned for and, 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 and helped out. That's a really great point, and I'm gonna I want to get to some of those human uh, human factors um, in in just a bit, and um, I I want to ask a couple questions first, just kind of again relating back to that data and how do we sort of how do we know um, you um, Joe earlier to earlier in in your remarks had talked about the percent positive rate and and sort of meeting uh, as a general benchmark to go from roughly 20% of those tested testing positive down to 10% um, testing positive. We had a question from the audience about guidelines for testing and uh, at least especially early on guidelines were, you know, people really couldn't get a test until unless it was really, really serious, severe, sometimes even until they were in the hospital. Um, talk about the guidelines for the testing and how the stringency or not stringency of those guidelines affects our understanding of just the prevalence of COVID in the population. Yeah, well, I, the well, you're calling guidelines, um, and 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 the situation where we were only testing the most serious is really just a function of the fact that we didn't have very many tests. So when you don't have a lot of tests available, then you do have to make decisions on who to test. And actually, once you're testing only the most severe, it has less and less um, surveillance and public health significance, and probably more clinical significance that, you know, wanting to know whether or not that person is positive in order to um, move forward on treatment. So really what, as we start ramping up in our testing, we can, can change the guidelines on who to test. And ideally, we really want to be testing anybody that shows any symptoms that is COVID-like, they should be able to get a test, just like we do with influenza. And then at that point, testing becomes much more of a public health surveillance tool and a containment tool because you test somebody that's positive, you, you, you contact trace, find those that are exposed, 
ideally the ones that are have high probability of infection because they were um, the exposure was was much more intimate, either being in a household together or work together, some, somewhere where you've had a lot of contact with that case, that you would want to test them also. And there, by, by doing that kind of testing, you can make any kind of containment much more efficient, where you're containing the people you know are infectious, or, or quarantining those people that you know they're infectious, rather than just having to guess or, or assume that they're infectious because you, you, they were in contact with somebody. So the, the, the goal with the testing is starting to ramp up and really be, be able to test as wide as we can because the wider the ability that we can test and, and um, the more information we have. So I mentioned the test positive, the percent tests that are positive is an indicator because as, that, as we move further and further down the epidemic curve, there's fewer and fewer cases, and therefore the test, we don't need as many tests, and the contact tracing is much more manageable. In some ways, that's what we're waiting for now. We're doing this mass, you know, untargeted social distancing in order to wait both for the testing to ramp up, also for the cases to drop down. Um, and there's going to be a, hopefully a sweet spot there where we're going to have the capacity of testing to be able to test anybody that's positive and test those um, contacts that have high probability of exposure. Great, and that's a perfect segue into uh, a question we got from the audience about contact tracing. So I want to stay on you for just just another um, minute, Joe, if if we could, and then um, and then uh, kind of expand on the conversation. But we had a question around contact tracing, and could you? Could you kind of spell out a little bit more just really how does the contract tracing work and um, what's the connection with testing? So the, the audience um, member asks us, for example, if a person is working in a store, they don't get tested, um, test, or maybe they get tested and then their test results don't come back for a while uh, until they've been potentially exposing people for a week or more, you know, hundreds of shoppers, that kind of thing. T talk a little bit about that intersection between the testing and the contact tracing and just like how does it actually work or how it's supposed to work in practice? Yeah, no, the testing is supposed to work in practice where you get results very quickly. If you're not if you're testing and not getting results for a week, that's that's not a very good system. And um, we're improving on that also. And 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 eventually we'll get these rapid tests that'll be you know incredibly quick um, turnaround, just like we have with influenza. So the idea is that if there's anybody that has any COVID suspected um, symptoms, they should be able to get tested. You know, you know that that could be at a clinic, but they could also, you know, many places around the world, and now even in this country, are having drive-through testing, which makes that more efficient. The test results um, would ideally come back quickly, matter of hours even, or or less, and then the contact tracing um, is basically interviewing that case that just got was diagnosed with. Uh, uh, as positive, and interviewing them about their contacts in the in the past a couple weeks, and then those contacts are then contacted. If you don't have sufficient testing for them, you're giving them advice about isolating for the next few weeks to see whether or not they um, become symptomatic. Ideally, if you have some, you have, you have the availability to do the testing, you can test those. You know, the priority would be those that add more intimate contact with the person um, along down the line. So the idea there, and that's why um, it was mentioned, I think, by Aaron, that this is really a labor-intensive um, um, activity, and we need the uh, public health workforce to be uh, ramped up to be able to do these kinds of uh, tracing activities. Back here in the University of Michigan, we are... Um, a lot of our MPH interns are um, taking on a lot of contact tracing activities. So basically doing those interviews, phone interviews, to find out who those contacts are and then calling those contacts and, and, and letting them know that they were potentially exposed and these are the guidelines for them to follow. Great. Thanks. So, so Jim, I'll turn to you uh, about just 
the role of the state and territorial health departments, the public health departments, in actually carrying out this contact tracing uh, in an ideal fashion, and um, just um, maybe maybe you can talk a little bit about just the the reality of it. Um, you know, when do, when have you seen it work well? When is it where is it not working well? What what's needed right now to make it work better? Um, and then you know, once you have sort of traced the contacts and and talked to them and you know kind of shared that information with them, like how do you um, you talked about the wraparound um, services, or, or one of you did, um, but just in the sense of, like, how is there enforcement? Are there enforcement mechanisms to require people to self-isolate, um, or is it more voluntary? Um, just talk about the spectrum of, of some of how it actually works on the ground. Sure, I'd be glad to. It's a, it's a great question. So the first point to make is that this is not a new or novel approach for COVID-19. Um, the art and science and practice of contact tracing has been a, a, a staple of public health programming for many, many years. Um, it's, it's, it's commonly used every day in sexually transmitted disease investigation. Um, and as Joe had mentioned, you know, once someone is confirmed um, with a disease, mostly through laboratory analysis, um, they are interviewed to assess who their, who, their, who their direct contacts were. And there's usually parameters, and I believe in the case of COVID-19 would be, you know, who have you been in close uh, contact with, uh, you know, household business within that six foot to 10 foot range um, for a period of time. Um, and, one, and, that will, and through interviewing, recall, and sort of the coaching and counseling from a, a skilled, um, contact tracer will, will hopefully um, yield um, accurate and complete information sufficient enough to then go back and interview those people. Um, their, their risk will be assessed um, as to whether or not they fall into the definition of a true contact. And, and if so, they would be counseled and, and advised on what to do. And as we mentioned before, the issue of it, you, know, you know staying at home for the 14-day period, these are the things you should watch as far as monitoring your own health. They'll be given guidance um, as to how they need to check in um, with the health department, um, either the old-fashioned way or through using modern technology and apps that were briefly mentioned. Um, and that will and that will play out until the person you know, remains well for that 14-day period. And if that person becomes ill, then that person too would be considered a person under investigation that would go through a COVID-19 workup, which would definitely require um, lab testing. During that interviewing, and, and, and that, I mean, it's all about, it really is all about interviewing, um, creating that safe space, that interaction with these individuals to have them be honest and truthful, but also be open to you when you're, you're going to give them good advice. Um, so part of that encounter is also assessing the challenges that they may, may um, deal, have to face of having to be in a confined space or under those conditions um, for that, uh, that period of time. So what, what, what the public health system is doing is taking, again, the, the playbook that has, that's being used every day in health departments for STDs, maybe TB and other diseases, and modifying it to the specifics of COVID-19. And with this, with, with this new army that we as a nation have to create um, quickly, there clearly is a, a training element of this because there's not enough people in state and local health departments to do this job. So the, those that are doing this every day will become the mentors, the trainers, the supervisors. But we're talking about bringing in either new personnel or reassignment of personnel from many federal agencies um, to, to meet this effort. So uh, training modules are being developed. This week, I believe two states um, already are starting to train at least the first cadre of new um, contact tracers for their communities. So it's, it's, it's uh, time is of the essence. And again, this is the the critical feature to the success of winning the war against COVID. All right, I want to ask you a couple of follow-up questions on that um, because you, you know you talked about this new army earlier. You, you mentioned um, an estimate of a minimum of a hundred thousand, um, which is in um, the Johns Hopkins paper that's on up on the Alliance website as a resource or will be um, soon. Um, it, it, but it sounds like with this human element, this trust element, I mean, you need a certain sort of like a special kind of, uh, you know, person. And, and earlier, Aaron mentioned, you know, t um, going in, talking to vulnerable populations, like what do they need? Um, you know, what's the sort of cultural aspect of this? So talk a little bit about like what kinds of people um, 
are 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 needed for this effort and who's who's going to hire them is it the public health department is it the state like who's actually in charge of you know hiring yeah sure so you know as far as the hiring i mean it it would be up to the up to the model and the consortium that a that a state or jurisdiction may may create you know some states may have good good partners with um uh, fiscal intermediaries or academic facilities um, some states may say we're bringing in on the payroll as a state FTE or or, or a temporary hire. So there are, there are multiple models that are again used every day in public health departments to do sort of this surge in these special project activities. The type the type of person will clearly um, uh, cultural sensitivity and awareness is is very important, and that's why you know one of the pipelines are um, existing community health workers um, that. Um, that sort of know the, the field, the profession, they know the community, and with a little bit of training could um, become um, um, competent enough in the, in the areas of COVID-19 to be a very skillful um, effort. Um, student, students in, in um, undergraduate and graduate uh, public health and, and biological science programs, again, an, another pipeline. Looking at retirees, whether individuals from uh, the public health workforce, or even the public safety workforce. Um, you know, one jurisdiction realizes that, you know, retired law enforcement officers, they're, they're skilled interviewers. Um, if they're good at community policing, um, you know, there's an assumption that they may really be, have, they, have, they may have the, the mindset, the, the attitude, the demeanor to work well in this type of setting. So, you know, we're exploring every option for every reasonable and viable pipeline um, of individuals that could um, meet the immediate need um, as well as the, the, the long-term need as this will continue, certainly for months, um, if not years going forward. Great, thanks. So um, I wanna ask um, Aaron, uh, we haven't heard from you in a little while, and I wanna ask a little bit, a little, a little bit more about the role of tech and apps in facilitating this contact tracing. Um, it sounds like obviously trust is going to be super critical to these these kinds of contact tracing interviews, and then obviously the steps that people need to take. Um, do, are, are people going to trust an app more than they trust a person, or like how can the apps help the contact tracers, um, you know, with their jobs? Um, and can you maybe share a little bit if you kind of, you know, have other countries used um, technology to positive effect? Yeah, all great questions. So let's let's take this in a couple of pieces. Number one. Um, it's it's first and foremost, folks got to realize that technology is not going to solve a problem by itself. And I, I implore people to realize that while we have all been empowered by our iPhones and, and you know, computers and the dawn of the personal computing age and what we're doing now with supercomputers, particularly here at UT Austin, um, that doesn't solve the problem. It, it's an augmentation. It's a way to ability, uh, ability to um, improve what you're doing. And it's also the ability to accelerate what you're doing. So Will contact tracing applications and systems and infrastructure help the process along and maybe not take as many contact tracers? Absolutely. I'll give you a real world example. Um, a company, actually a health system that we we're partnering with in Seattle that was doing some home monitoring and contact tracing on a lightway were telling me that for one contact tracer, they could, they could trace four to five uh, persons of interest or families or individuals an hour, right? So if you extrapolate that out with a number of people that needed to do, and this is manual, this is calling people up on an Excel sheet, you're documenting it, and it's all old school workflow. You think about how slow and mundane it is. However, if I can accelerate leveraging smart apps, if I can accelerate leveraging some sort of Bluetooth BLE technology, which is you know kind of what Apple and Google are talking about, if, if you can do those things, you now ex exponentially increase uh, how fast you are able to do contact tracing. Still need contact tracers, but they're able to get faster, right? So uh, will apps and, and where people feel more engaged with an application, perhaps, but I also have another saying I always say, which is don't be creepy with your technology. It's very, very important that you uh, get consent that you are transparent with what you're doing, that you let people know, you know, if you consent and adding your information as application, this is what it's going to do. Maybe it looks at your contact list on your phone and it uploads that to a central repository. You tell them, hey, we'll destroy it after 45 days or when the pandemic is over, whatever that is, you have to be explicit. So I think that, um, yes, uh, there are apps and there's technology that will help. Yes, that people will have some reservations as they should, but if hospital systems and public health authorities and others are very, very upfront and transparent, 
there shouldn't be too much of a problem getting uh, at least a, a major traction to where you get at least 60, 70, 80 percent of the population and you take care of them. Now, I was saying earlier, you know, a good portion of your population does not have a smartphone, or if they do own a smartphone, they don't know how to use it. You'd be amazed at how many people we have tried to contact trace and say, hey, go download this app. That's the UT Health Austin app. And they're like, how do I do that? You know, and it's like, what do you mean? Don't you have a smartphone? Well, yeah, I've never downloaded it off an app store, though. Okay. So there's a, there's a level of engagement in terms of education, in terms of awareness. There's other social needs they need. Perhaps they live in a food desert and they haven't eaten for a week. Here in Texas, we have very long food lines. So a lot of people right now are struggling without eating. You think they're really going to want to go download an app? So these components all play into it. Now, the other part of your question, which is, has Europe and other places done this? Yes, they have. South Korea is a great example. Look what they did there. They were on top of it full scale. You know, if you look at a, a, a very different kind of society with China, they did the same thing there. So technology can be used for good or it can be used for other purposes as well. And the key and difference there is being transparent and making sure that you tell the public what you're doing with their data so they'll be bought in for the common good. That's great. And I'm, I'm glad you said, uh, you know, don't be creepy with your technology because we did have a question from the audience about whether the use of technology or whether the surveillance in general threatens people's privacy. So I wonder if you could maybe just say a few, few words about uh, the privacy implications and then I would certainly invite um, Jim and Joe to weigh in as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there, there are, of course, privacy considerations, you know, across the country, we have, you know, 50 wonderful states with 50 states of variation of privacy law, and then, of course, federal law as well. Uh, there's, of course, GDPR and other components when you go across waters. You have things like FERPA, which I have to comply with being in university. I mean, there's a litany of things. If you're a minor, then, of course, there's consent rules there. So you have to be mindful of all of that. None of that is put aside during a pandemic. What is put aside, though, is the ability for you to share information with transparency to the person of, hey, may I call your hair salon and ask them who was around you because you don't remember. You just know there's a lot of people around you getting their hair done, too, right? So you have that ability to ask those questions, but you can't break the glass and, and go break all the laws because, oh, it's a pandemic. We have to go do this. No, that's not how this works, right? But the component of it is that I go back to transparency. If you're transparent with people, most folks out there want to help. I, we have not run into one person that we've called up and said, hey, you know, we think you may have been exposed uh, to COVID-19 in your, in your daily uh, passerby. There was somebody that reported that. Could you please tell me where you were on this day at this time and who was around you? There's been no one that said, oh, my goodness, I don't want to participate. You're creepy. Why are you calling me? Everybody wants to help. But the key to it is to be transparent and above board and make sure folks don't understand, don't, don't misunderstand that you're trying to misuse their data. Jim or Joe, anything to add to that? Well, this is Jim. I mean, just to reinforce the point that 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 an app's a tool, and you got to know its limits and its capabilities. And 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 I think Aaron did an outstanding job of of discussing its strengths and weaknesses and the parameters to be used. The the only thing that I would add is that you know you know all well intentioned that the public health community is um, being inundated. Maybe that's too strong of a word. But they're certainly being approached by many, many entities that have technology solutions to contact tracing in other aspects of this response and recovery. And I think the biggest challenge right now is assessing um, their, their capabilities, their limitations, their vulnerabilities, and which ones have great promise and which ones can be used to, to increase the level of, of interoperability between the various players that uh, not only within it with it with an intrastate but with an interstate or national um, common operating picture, so I think that is, that's the challenge that the folks in the field are working with is how do you how do you take all of these ideas and and prototypes and beta tests and and try to you know assess it like you do any other thing you would buy either you're at home or, or at work um, to make sure you're investing your money well and it's going to give you what you need. Great, thank you. All right, believe it or not, we have uh, only just about five minutes left in the webinar. So uh, we've had a few more questions come in from the audience. I'm gonna try to weave them in and I'm gonna try to make them um, just a little bit kind of future focused. Um, so um, we're just gonna go to each of you and Erin, I'd really like to start with you. So one audience question was, um, 
can you clarify if states or localities have guidelines or explicit criteria to compile data, define criteria? I'm just, if you can speak to any kind of existing efforts that you know of, and then I'm going to throw you a curveball and just ask, as, as we look to analyzing the data and, and moving forward, is there a role for AI in this or is it already being used? So, um, you could go ahead yeah, and so, so, that. Um, yeah, so both, yeah. Both, both great questions, and I'll try to keep it brief. So one, are there criteria for data you need to collect? Yes. There's a national CDC form. Uh, in our case, we have a local, local Austin public health form. Uh, there's also state, uh, Texas state uh, forms with data elements and criteria that we need to, we need to capture and, and gather. Uh, for the most part, there's a, there's a large degree of overlap on the data sets, which is good. Um, some of those forms are exactly what you think they are. They are non-discrete field forms, so you have to turn them into discrete data to be able to then make it interoperable, as was being said earlier. But to the degree of it, those data elements are there. So that'll get you 70% of the way there. Then it's about understanding your actual population of people that you're working with, right? As I told you, Austin has some, some uniqueness to it, given that we have a 60% of our population is Spanish speaking. The average age of the person in the city is under the age of 40. So there's some dynamics here that are, are unique to you that you need to incorporate into that. But the combination of the two and closely partnering with your public health authority. I can't stress that enough. Your job is not to be the public health authority, but to help them and to augment them and to partner with the city. That's one. And then on your curveball question there, um, really, I mean, to the degree of, of, of what, what we're trying to accomplish and what we're trying to do, there, there is a lot of ability for AI to be there, but the data has to be in a way that's uniform and is, is trackable and is traceable, meaning there's a you know, primary key and a secondary key and all those sorts of things. The one thing we lack in this country is a master patient index, a unique primary uh, patient identifier. So it's hard to be able to track Aaron across state lines. But I do believe with enough data elements that do coalesce together and say that you, know, you get social security number right or you get a home address right, you can create basically a master patient index. So to the degree of it, there is a role for AI. There is definitely a role for machine learning. We're doing that now. Um, but it's take a lot more data and a lot more uniformity of data, which is, goes back to my earlier comments around standards. Great, thanks. All right, so Joe, I want to ask you a couple questions. You know, we, we haven't talked a lot about the serological testing and the immunity. If you could um, maybe touch on that, ask about, you know, are, how are states balancing the need for serological testing with ongoing constraints of um, appropriate um, numbers of diagnostic tests? And then we had an audience question around, um, it, national immunity registries um, being used, and, and is that something that that you can um, speak to? Right. Oh, um, Joe. There you go. Yeah, my. You hear me? Yep. Can you hear me now? Sorry. We can hear you, Joe. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Um. So yeah. So immunity and. Um, so oh, serologic testing. I think serologic testing is a critical um, test moving forward. It's it, it's not as important in the immediate need of flattening the curve, but moving forward and understanding how widespread the infection really is, we can only do through serology. You know, getting doing tests to see if a person um, has elevated antibodies suggests that they who are exposed to um, COVID-19, and and therefore it gives us a sense of how many people are exposed, and therefore presumably how much protection there is. Um, but the, the caveat is we don't exactly know how well protection is, and and antibody response is is not the same as protection. So there may be antibodies that that are there that actually say that, oh, yes, you were exposed, doesn't necessarily mean and doesn't tell you how strong that protection is or what protection there is. And we don't actually know a lot about this virus right now as far as how much protection it will give and how long that protection will last. We do know a fair amount about other COVID or coronaviruses that are endemic in the U.S. Um, that, that, that give the common cold. We do, we do know that there there is that conferred immunity, but we actually don't know exactly what that means with this um, virus. We want to be a little careful. You mentioned the um, National Registry. Um, I think that, that 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 may be a little premature because we're then jumping the gun on exactly how protected somebody really is. 
Um, protection can be anything from complete to partial. And so, um, especially somebody that's a higher risk, we don't want to make that assumption that there's complete protection before we actually know. Um, I think in the long run, if this virus is, you know, operates like all the, many other viruses that are similar to it, you know, that protection and that herd immunity will build. We just don't know how long that will take, if it'll take repeated infections. And, and so there's a lot of uncertainty with this. Um, right now, the power of the tool is really to tell us how widespread the infection has been. Um, and we've got to learn a lot more about the degree that it's actually protecting. Great, thanks. All right, Jim, I, I want to ask you the last question in sort of the last minute that we have left. Um, you know, we have heard so much about the role of public health. I think everyone is quickly uh, getting up to speed on key public health terms. Uh, but we know that it, it's usually sort of not in the spotlight um, as long as things are going well. Um, do you think that that everything that's happening right now as far as the, the response to COVID is going to help to shore up the public health infrastructure for the longer term? Um, you know, unfortunately, looking down the road at potential, you know, future public health issues, um, just speak a little bit to the, the public health infrastructure in this country and kind of what we're learning. And do you think do you think we'll be shored up for the future? As a result of this, well, well, that's a great question, and certainly for one to close. I mean, I, I certainly hope so, um, but I mean, it, there's got to be a huge caveat to this. Um, you know, every time you know, and I've been in this career, this profession, a long time, and every time we have a major event, um, there are lessons learned, and we keep on saying we hope this is a wake-up call. And what we're finding is, um, you know, policymakers and funders. Um, respond to the emergency of the day um, with emergency funding. And over time, um, that just wanes and the core capacity continues to erode. This is an historic event. You know, going forward, we will learn a lot. We will continue to be stronger for the next one, heaven forbid, as we've done over the last 20 years. But what this is really meaning is, is all those other public health programs, you know, they're going to be long lasting clinical impacts on our society. Um, and we can't let that happen. I mean, we're, we're you know, you, well, everyone saw the news. I mean, there are, there are public health departments, state, state governments laying off professionals, hospitals um, furloughing nurses at a time when not only today, but next month, five years from now, we need them more than ever on the job, um, recognizing that the public health workforce has basically eroded by 25% you know, since 2008, um, and not quite sure what's, you know, when the dust clears on this one, where we're going to be. So I'm hoping that basically it's, a, it's, it's the biggest of all wake-up calls. There's a, there's a more clear recognition that public health security is a matter of national security, and that we just can't, you know, fight the last fight, and be, but be better prepared um, so that we can truly um, address the everyday, everyday emergencies and needs of society but also these major events that are going to continue to come our way more frequently and more severely. Well, thank you. And we'll end on that note. Uh, Jim Blumenstock, Aaron Meary, Joe Eisenberg, thank you for joining us. Thank you to our audience for sticking with us today. Uh, you can take a look at allhealthpolicy.org for the recording of this webinar uh, later this afternoon. And please stay tuned for future announcements of COVID-19 related webinars in our series. Thanks everybody. Hope you stay well, stay safe, wash your hands, all that good stuff, and have a good weekend.